Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rational Space Disputations. I'm Francis Widowson. And uh, if you've seen the first two episodes, you'll know that I was a professor at Mount Royal University until 2021. And uh, what I want to do now is have on some people uh, who I admire or find their work interesting. And we're going to have uh, a, a few hours of conversation, disputation, I like to call it. So we're hoping to get into some of the areas where we disagree and dig a little bit deeper into that, not in any kind of uh, a, a way which has animosity, but just trying to figure things out a little bit. And my guest for the third episode is Brian Giesbrecht. And Brian, I'm not sure when we met, it was a couple of years ago, I think, or maybe not. Um, but I have been aware of Brian's work for quite some time. In fact, I first heard of Brian when Albert and I, Albert Howard and I were writing our book, Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry. And Brian was the, uh, is a, is a, used to be a judge, a, a Manitoba court judge. And Brian headed an inquiry about a boy who had killed himself, whose name was Lester Desjardins. And I was very intrigued by this and I was very impressed by Brian's um, you know, clear thoughts on the matter and also his attempts to kind of get to the truth as to what had happened in the Lester Desjardins case. So um, anyway, so uh, Brian is, 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 is our guest today. And I just wanted to maybe start off, Brian, by, you know, having you tell the audience something, you know, some things about yourself, what you, what your history is perhaps, and what some uh, things that you've been involved in. And what I'll do is I'll ask Brian uh, for an hour of questions about his, uh, his work and, and what he thinks. And then what we'll do is, because this is the disputations, is we'll turn the, the screens and then Brian will have an hour to ask me questions about things that he, he's interested in or things that perhaps we hadn't really covered in enough detail in the first hour. So I'll let you just start things off, Brian. Okay, I, I uh, became a judge in 1976 and I was appointed to the what was then the, the family division of the provincial court. And I heard um, husband and wife um, uh, matters, custody matters, et cetera. But mainly I was involved in, um, in youth court as well as child welfare court. And in our area where I work and I had, I, I had a circuit, um, many of the people were, were indigenous. Uh, I traveled to um, um, what were then called reserves and what are now more commonly called First Nations communities. And uh, I changed roles somewhat in uh, about 1990 when I, when I went over to the criminal side. So I stayed there till 2007. So I've had about half my judicial career dealing with um, family matters and half with uh, criminal matters. And in both cases was heavily involved with indigenous people. And uh, the, the uh, inquiry you uh, referred to was, and I think it started in about 1990. And that involved a uh, uh, young man who had uh, committed suicide uh, while in the custody of a, a child, uh, welfare agency. That was uh, sort of the beginning of the time when the native child welfare agencies took over from um, the other child welfare agencies. So uh, I won't go into any detail about that um, uh, particular uh, report. It's still available online. It's uh, the Lester de Jarlis inquiry report. You can still actually read it. It's about 300 pages. So <laughs> you have to have lots of time. But generally, uh, I, I became very interested in, 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 in what was happening at that time. And I was particularly, and I've always been particularly uh, concerned about uh, how uh, Indigenous uh, matters go. And just to give you uh, just a slight idea of, 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 of my interest, uh, there were families that I started with in child welfare court in 1976 that I ended my career dealing with. And uh, they started from 
um, being apprehended as, as, as children and then going through youth court and then adult court and very often um, um, uh, um, many of them were, were were dead by the time I by the time I retired and 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 indigenous people were just not doing very well at all. Uh, that is uh, the indigenous people sort of caught in the uh, um, the underclass uh, where they were unemployed, dependent, very often even unemployable, and uh, basically uh, just sort of spinning their wheels. In other words, they were no better off in nineteen in two thousand and eight. Uh, when I retired, then they were in 1976 when I started. So I uh, re retired at least in part to start doing some looking into this and writing about it. And that's that's what I have been doing. So for the past uh, number of years, I've been a, a minor writer uh, of newspaper columns, essays, and uh, uh, a couple of books. Uh, so that that's probably enough of an introduction. I don't want to <laughs> bore people with a long history here. Yes. Um, and so you mentioned that you saw a lot of uh, difficulties in during your time when you were uh, a judge. And, and when did you retire, Brian? 2007. 2007. Yeah. Um, and so what, what were, uh, and this is something what we, 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 that we can get into and something that I'm very interested in is what do you think is, is sort of some of the major causes for why there is this underclass that, that doesn't that seems to be perhaps saying the same proportion of the population, maybe it's even increasing. Um, what do you see the, the, the causes of that as being? Well, I, I, I see it as mainly related to the fact that indigenous people lived on reserves, they were isolated and they became more and more dependent. And uh, the dysfunction that um, uh, arose from that, um, uh, it took place over more than a hundred years, and it's going to be many, many years before it, 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 it is solved. One thing it did not have really much to do with at all, and we can talk about this at length, but is residential schools, because <laughs> for, most of, for most of my career, um, the discussion about residential schools that I did have with people consisted of, uh, uh, certainly some people complained about uh, the uh, schools and about the uh, the food and the loneliness at schools, et cetera. But there was no discussion at all about them being uh, sort of the house of horror depictions that we have today. Absolutely no discussion about um, children being uh, murdered there or secretly buried or anything like that. That's all, as I see it, a relatively recent invention. That's, that's taken place over the last couple of decades. So while I was uh, working, most of the discussion really was about, oh, uh, improper government policy, uh, racism, which is definitely a factor. Um, but it didn't have a, really anything to do with residential schools. If anything, the, um, the, the chiefs and the sort of the leading uh, families in the reserve were, were descendants of, of uh, people who had gone to residential school or they had gone there themselves. So they were the actual uh, sort of the, what would you call it, the educated uh, elite on the reserves. And they, they were sort of disproportionately represented uh, within the leading, leading families. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I would say that the main reason, uh, and I, I don't pr pretend to be an expert in this, but I believe that the main reason for the uh, dysfunction in indigenous communities has to do with being isolated, uh, dependent uh, on a reserve while uh, the country around you was uh, uh, modernizing. And, uh, it, uh, and, and then this dysfunction uh, really, um, uh, it took a turn for the worse once um, more money was introduced onto the reserve, once the reserve some, uh, uh, suddenly, rather suddenly, became more accessible, people started going to town, liquor became uh, 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 more available, and, uh, and then things really broke down 
in the, um, I would say in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. So, so did you have any um, interaction with the urban indigenous people or was it? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, yes. So there are similar, um, there's similar problems in the urban uh, population as well. Or do you find that it's, it's less so with the urban? Uh, well, I, I, I would describe it as, as in, in the cities I'm familiar with in Brandon, Manitoba, Winnipeg, uh, uh, Regina, Saskatoon, Edmonton, these cities, um, there are uh, really urban uh, offshoots of the reserves where many uh, Indigenous people who have uh, reserve roots um, live or even go back and forth because many of the people are not uh, in the underclass people I'm talking about. Uh, do not have, have have strong roots in the cities. And many of them actually go back and forth between the reserve and the cities. Now I'm generalizing a great deal here because there are really two classes of uh, indigenous people. There's a, 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 a a middle class, working class, and even I mean, a, and even a wealthier class, an elite, elite class, mm -hmm. and those people do just fine. There's no mm -hmm. problem there at all. They mm -hmm. have they have uh, become completely integrated. They're not marginalized at all, and in many ways, they're doing at least as well as the uh, the mainstream population. What I'm referring to here is the is the uh, uh, deeply entrenched uh, underclass that lives both. Um, a, on reserves in cities and between reserve and cities. Yes. So because it, it can be either urban or on the reserve, it seems that the isolation that you're talking about is not necessarily a geographical kind of concept. Is, is there like what what are you um, what are you talking about when you talk about this isolation? Uh, which well. Is the reserves I'm familiar with really were isolated until relatively recently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, um, uh, it wasn't until really uh, well after the, the Second World War that they even, um, you know, you even had plowed roads in the winter uh, uh, that people had uh, um, uh, vehicles and that people could even come to, to cities. As a matter of fact, we, we forget, but there were, were laws about leaving the reserve. You had to have a pass and that type of thing. And there were, there were strong liquor laws against mm -hmm. uh, indigenous people having liquor. It was not until um, uh, I think it was 1951 when, uh, when liquor uh, could even be purchased by, uh, by indigenous people. And interestingly enough, that was uh, really a part of the, uh, the demands that their chiefs had made when the treaties were first signed in the 1870s and 80s. They, they had seen around them what a devastating effect liquor had had. And the progressive chiefs uh, demanded that there be a clause saying that um, uh, n n liquor would not be allowed on the reserve. Now, um, uh, it was after the uh, Supreme Court ruled in the Dry Bones case, that was a Bill of Rights case, that, um, uh, that uh, those laws were unfair, mm -hmm. um, uh, that uh, things really did start to, to explode. And, and, and as more money became available, and particularly the welfare checks after the, uh, you know, during the war on poverty, Lyndon Johnson years in the 1960s, when the welfare checks started to get, um, you know, quite generous, that's when uh, the use of liquor just uh, got out of control. So on the reserves that I dealt with, um, I was, I think, what I'll, I'll just refer to Harold Johnson's book. You probably read that. Uh, yes, he's yep. a Cree writer. It's called Firewater. And he, yep. he was a Crown prosecutor himself. And he said, really, the, the judge, the prosecutor, the lawyers, the social workers, when they went onto those reserve courts, what they really were, were functioning at as were alcohol aftermath counselors. And I thought that really was a very good description because mm -hmm. Every one of the cases had to do with the aftermath of alcohol use, uh, the domestic abuse cases, the sexual assault cases, the uh, uh, I, almost every case had something to do with alcohol. So you really, you were really not doing anything in terms of uh, um, 
um, uh, complicated ju judicial decision making, you were sort of mopping up the <laughs> afterwards. And um, I, so I always thought that Harold Johnson had it completely nailed with mm -hmm. that term, alcohol yeah. after yeah. math counselor. And so, and, and I, I've, I've heard, I, I've read his book and, and I've, I've thought about this a bit as well in terms of the alcohol. Um, so what, what, why is it, do you think that alcohol has had such a devastating impact? And it's kind of a, it's an interesting question because we have, you know, many societies throughout the world, uh, alcohol as part of their culture is, is been absorbed. I'm not sure if there's other populations that are similar in terms of having alcohol have such a detrimental effect. Is it the speed at which alcohol was introduced? Is it because the, that they're the kind of restraints? So if you look at a country like France, for example, where alcohol is just constantly available everywhere, every possible context you can imagine. You go into a cafe in the morning and there's at least a few, there's a few people having alcohol with their breakfast, yet you don't have the same catastrophic kinds of results. So, so what is it about you know, the, the indigenous population or the isolated indigenous population that, uh, that has made this the case, do you think? Well, I, I would say that, that uh, it, it, it is a common problem uh, with all of the countries that have colonized uh, indigenous people. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in Australia with the Aboriginal population, um, the United States with their Native American population and even New Zealand with the Maori population, they all have similar um, uh, problems with alcohol use within the indigenous population. Now, it's certainly not within my uh, expertise to, to actually understand this, but I have done some, some research into this. And it's really quite interesting that the uh, binge drinking um, tradition that sort of started with the fur traders uh, I have, you know, the uh, Hudson Bay Company, the the uh, the, the Cree would would uh, would um, would bring uh, the furs up, the made beaver uh, up to the forts, for instance, and then everybody would get drunk. The uh, the, the 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 Indians, uh, along with the uh, the Orkney men working at the at the 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 forts, and every everybody would get drunk for a week, and then the Indians would go home. Now. Mm -hmm. That wasn't that devastating because I mean that happened a, a few times a year. But once once the Northwest Company came and started trading uh, actively with Indians, well, alcohol became the number one <laughs> trade good, and uh, then uh, uh, binge drinking really did take over, and it almost subverted uh, many of the tribes in in, in Canadian history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the um, uh, the Blackfoot were almost ruined by alcohol. And as we know, John A. MacDonald uh, formed the Northwest Mounted Police basically to, to chase the uh, American whiskey traders uh, down back down south because the, the Indian populations were actually um, being ruined, were actually uh, killing themselves. Yeah, combina the, the deadly combination of disease, namely mainly sp smallpox and alcohol, was almost wiping out certain Indian populations. So, um, and we had uh, chiefs like Poundmaker and some of the other chiefs thank uh, the 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 police and everything for for doing what they they did and getting rid of the the alcohol because they saw what it was doing to their people so in short i'm not exactly uh you know i'm not qualified to 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 uh, to really uh, give a professional opinion about this mm -hmm. but it does seem that reserve life with its combination of uh, say lack of purpose and dependence on the government mm -hmm. combined with the availability of alcohol caused just an enormous problem. And the problems we're, we're seeing uh, what was called the 60 scoop 
for instance. And nowadays we call the indigenous child welfare problem. Well, that same problem existed during residential school days, particularly in the uh, uh, post-war years in the 50s and 60s. So that same indigenous uh, child welfare problem existed in those years, but the only place where those children could go was residential schools because the federal government did not have any child um, machinery to apprehend children. So they used the Indian agent to do that. And uh, the federal government did not have any specialized uh, child welfare institutions. So basically they used uh, residential schools almost as uh, a repository for, uh, for um, uh, indigenous child welfare problems. And when I say indigenous child welfare problems, I'm talking about neglected children, neglected because of the use of alcohol in the home. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and do you think that um, fetal alcohol syndrome has much, like, I'm not sure exactly what the nature of alcohol use is. So I, I assume it's likely if you have a, a person who's suffers from fetal alcohol syndrome, it's possible that they also might be inclined to use alcohol in that way. Is, is that part of it? Uh, it? And I certainly know that it's something that's a big problem that's not talked about very much, but is it, but is it related in any way to the continued problems with alcohol that, that Indigenous people in isolated areas have? Uh, not only in isolated areas, but in, in, in cities too. Here's, a, here's kind of a scary uh, estimate. They say that uh, in Winnipeg, uh, something like 80% of the homeless people are Indigenous, but most of those people are former uh, wards of a child caring agency, and most of those are fetal alcohol people. So many of the people that you see with mental difficulties, obvious mental difficulties, yes. Those are fetal alcohol problems. So the answer is, is yes, a, a, a fetal alcohol person would be much more likely to be um, in, 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 uh, in trouble with the law, have addiction problems. And unfortunately, it's not just alcohol now because mm, yes, uh, fentanyl, these other fentanyl. drugs like meth uh, and fentanyl have, have, have uh, just made the, 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 the issue far worse. Yeah. So yes, the fetal alcohol problem in remote communities is... In, incredibly serious. Some of the communities have a high percentage of people who are fetal alcohol, but they're scattered throughout the population. And uh, uh, within the indigenous population, there's a huge disproportion of, of fetal alcohol children, adults, even grandparents. So it is a really big problem. It's not something that's discussed. Unfortunately, instead of discussing these very serious problems and trying to find solutions, the focus is all on residential schools and uh, other boogeymen like the, uh, this, this new one of the, uh, 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 the, the missing children and unmarked graves. And the focus all becomes on these exaggerated uh, uh, problems that really have little, little to do with the really huge problems that are not finding a solution. Yes, and uh, we're going to get into the <laughs> the residential schools uh, at some point. Um, but because of your role as a judge, uh, I was interested before we talk about that. I was interested in your views on the the prison population, the justice system uh, uh, circumstances. Um, I've heard that a large number of indigenous uh, people who are incarcerated who are indigenous is, is fetal alcohol syndrome is, is related to that as well, because um, evidently uh, it's, it's, it results in, the condition results in people having difficulties with impulse control. Like that's one of the, the, the symptoms of the, the condition and therefore violence and all these sorts of things while being, as you've mentioned, alcohol related, it, it's possible that it could be fetal alcohol syndrome related as well. The, the criminality, the, 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 uh, the larger proportion of criminality 
uh, that exists with respect to the prison population and indigenous people. Oh yes, I think so. The the impulse control is a huge part of it. So I know um, uh, some of the uh, provincial jails, for instance, have special wings now to deal with fetal alcohol people. They try mm -hmm. to protect them because uh, in many ways, the fetal alcohol people are also very easily, uh, they're suggestible and they'll be used by the other prisoners for all sorts of nefarious purposes. Mm -hmm. So within the prisons, no, it's within the prisons, it's a very serious problem. Within the child welfare problem, system, it's also a very serious uh, problem. And it's, it's really not even possible to get an estimate of how many people have been damaged in the womb because most fetal alcohol people don't show any obvious physical effects. Most of them, um, it, 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 there, there's brain damage, but they have never even been assessed, formally assessed. So it is, it's one of those, those, those huge uh, problems that's really not spoken about and mm. as I say, these things are the, exactly the problems that should be discussed. Yeah. So we could yeah. try to find solutions, but instead we're concentrating on all sorts of uh, almost irrelevant topics. Mm. And so in your view, uh, you, you mentioned uh, besides racism being one of the, the problems that has resulted in this you know, ongoing underclass uh, improper policy with something else that you, you mentioned. and, and I was wondering if you could just elaborate upon what, what kinds of policies you think have resulted in this continuing underclass, the improper, what you would characterize as being improper policies. Well, in my, in my opinion, uh, it's just uh, catering to dependency. In other words, instead of trying to do something about uh, people, say, on a remote reserve who are never going to be able to find a job, instead of um, simply sending the money and hoping the problem somehow solves itself, what we should have been doing is offering uh, solutions that would help these people move to employment centers and give them, uh, give them assistance while they're obtaining the education and training that they need. But instead, we're pretending because the chiefs and the other uh, advocates want us to, we're pretending that some of these remote communities are going to somehow spring into life and develop their own economies. Well, I, th I think that has been a, just a, an absolutely deadly formula because even in um, um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm from a rural area and, 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 and uh, even in, a, in the area I live in, young people, aren't all able to find jobs in the, mm -hmm. in the rural area, nor do they want to. They, maybe half of the young people want to go to the city and uh, their, their career plans involve going to university or doing a job that can only be, be done in the city. But we pretend that somehow uh, people in even less economically advantaged areas, say remote reserves or any reserves, somehow they should stay there and do uh, and do what? Uh, uh, you know, you, there are certain jobs. You could be the chief, you could be a counselor, and you, know, you can have, and some of these reserves do have an economic um, opportunities, but some have none. So mm -hmm. the, only, the only option really is to sit around doing practically nothing and that's a deadly formula. So I, I would say that what we should have, if there's one thing we should be doing with indigenous people that we, we have never done is just treat them like everybody else. Yes, mm -hmm. offer assistance to people who need training, job training and everything like that. But don't pretend that just because an indigenous person is indigenous, uh, they should um, somehow be exempt from all the normal rules that society sets for supporting yourself etc mm -hmm. so i would say the dependency problem is uh, if there is any one uh, problem that we should be looking at it's, it's the dependency which has grown up in these communities and so then if if so from what i understand your view is basically provide indigenous people with the supports to to move to an area that is that is more viable uh is that is that generally what you're proposing well you know i uh, going back in history the report that i think we do not 
look at any more that we should. Everybody looks at the 1969 attempt by Pierre Trudeau to do away with the, uh, uh, the Indian Act. Well, that was actually done quite clumsily. The report we should be look, looking at is the 1967 Hawthorne Report. That mm. sort of uh, was known uh, uh, for its use of the term citizen plus, which many mm. people found um, uh, a bit offensive. But really, when you look further into the report, what they said was very useful because they said, well, of course, we can't just uh, expect everybody in a, uh, on a reserve to move to town. That's not going to work. Mm. Uh, what we should be doing is, is providing basic support in those communities. In other words, yes, if you wanted to stay in that community, um, there would be basic supports, et cetera. But we should be uh, recognizing that uh, Indigenous young people want the same things that non-Indigenous young people do, and we should be trying to help them move yeah. to centers instead of flooding the reserves with, with money yeah. and just absolutely encouraging the dependents to, to, uh, to, 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 to stay in, entrenched, so entrenched. Yeah. And, and so, but I'm just wondering, because we do have these, these underclass populations in the cities, what would prevent that same kind of thing just happening of them just moving to the cities and, and not being able to cope and, and just becoming part of the underclass that exists in the cities? Well, well, I would I would say that the the the, the part about the the Hawthorne report that we should have been paying attention to was their uh, education uh, mm. uh, section because he said no exactly you can't just expect people to move to a reserve and go to a town they're going to fail and that that is ex exactly what has happened with so many people what we should be doing is is offering first class. Uh, education, and then we should even be following the, the people to a city to assist them while they establish themselves. I've even suggested, and this is a this is considered a bit radical, but I've even suggested uh, a type of residential school for the entire family. So instead of just taking the children, and um, which was a which was a mistake, you take the entire family. I'm not saying you you relocate them against their will. I'm talking about people that yeah. want a better life for themselves. Yeah, yeah. So you you are you're able to 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 have the whole family move to a center where they are much more likely to find employment and success, and then work with the entire family uh, so that they have a better chance of succeeding. But as it is, we've just had people move from reserves where they've uh, not been trained for modern life at all. They, they have very poor education. And then they just form uh, similar dependent, poor uh, communities, ghettos within, uh, within the city. Yeah. Um, one proposal that was floated that I was kind of interested in, uh, which I talked about in Separate but Unequal, was the case of Kisheshwan. And there were a bunch of proposals, because Kisheshwan, of course, is, is for people who don't know what that community, uh, the circumstances there, it, it's one of the most obvious cases where that community cannot continue, like, uh, because it's on a floodplain and every couple of years it gets flooded and then they have to relocate the population to hotels for a few months while they get the flooding sorted out. And so it's, it's recognized that that's not a viable, uh, although there's many other places that aren't viable, but this is an extreme example. And so one of the, there's a number of proposals that were made and one of them, the one that was promoted by the person who did the reports was to move the entire community. I think it was, 20 kilometers or 20 miles outside of Timmins. So you would have the community would remain intact so that you could, because that's kind of one of the concerns is if, if you just focus on the families, those connections that people have as a community will no longer be in place. And, and, and it, there could be an accusation made that you're sort of destroying the, the community fabric. So the community would remain intact, but what it would do is it would provide opportunities for young people to go and you know see a movie in Timmins or go and play in a hockey game or watch a hockey game and and there would be services that could be accessed in Timmins but also you'd have the community that would would be 
intact and would be able to have those kinds of the sorts of supports which are which yeah. are claimed to be important. Uh, have have you given any thought to that? Uh, to that? Yeah, uh, Gordon Gibson um, uh, proposed um, uh, a very similar idea. I think he called it the community of uh, of excellence a number of years ago. And and I, I think all of those 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 ideas are worth considering. The problem is the biggest problem, as I see it, is the opposition from the chiefs, mm -hmm. because the chiefs are proposing a completely opposite uh, model where they remain separate and mm -hmm. where they reject the idea that that they have to uh, um, uh, and deal with what you call the develop uh, de developmental gap what Tom mm -hmm. Flanagan calls the civilization gap. And mm -hmm. I think that until they, 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 they do acknowledge that there is a huge gap uh, with some of these remote communities, I don't see anything changing. Instead, what the chiefs are proposing is that no, they, what they need is even more separateness. Yeah. So they yeah. need more uh, uh, separate laws and then they're going to develop their separate economies and that sort of thing. And I think that's just a deadly formula. The, what has worked, what has worked with, uh, with people who have uh, indigenous people who have, have integrated and uh, are doing just fine is integration that's exactly what what they've done and you know just to just to get a, give an example if i can just put a put a, a sort of a name on this and i'll just use a politician because uh, he's uh, and i'm not going to say anything bad about him so so uh, uh, uh you know i don't think i'll be sued here but uh <laughs> wab canoe <laughs> wab canoe is 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 manitoba's um, ndp he's the opposition leader Okay, mm -hmm. and he's an indigenous guy, yes. and highly successful, nice-looking, uh, smart guy, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So, but what what I'm saying is here here is he's completely integrated. He goes to work like everybody else. He pays his mortgage and takes his kid to, to soccer and that sort of thing. And yet he's proudly indigenous. So, I mean, he'll wear some indigenous type of clothing. You know, Perry Bellegarde did that too. He looked really good at it. So you'd wear a buckskin jacket or wee beads or something to show that, you know, that you're indigenous. But at the same time, you're just a uh, you're just an a, a integrated person and you're living like everybody else. And it's so obvious that that is the answer. That's the answer for indigenous people to yeah. integrate into the economy. It doesn't mean that you're going to be, you're going to lose your culture or you're going to be forced to assimilate or anything like that. You're able to choose to retain as much of your indigenous culture as, as you want, but that's not what the indigenous advocates say. They say, no, we have to remain separate and we're very different from you. And no, we're not like you. Well, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's just a recipe for disaster. They don't have to say, well, I want to give up my indig uh, I can't even say the word, my uh, indigenous culture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They could say, no, I want to be economically um, uh, uh, successful and I want to learn the skills necessary to integrate into the economy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I want to remain an indigenous person and that's going to be my primary identity. And I don't think anybody would have any problem with that. Very yeah. similar to our Quebec situation where you have uh, people who uh, have their first, uh, they identify as, as Quebecois before being Canadian. Well, yeah. that's, that works. That's fine. They're, they're, they're part of Canada. They're, uh, you know, uh, economically productive, etc. But the indigenous leaders seem to want to insist that they are so separate that they don't have to sort of play by the same rules as everybody else, but they do. If you want to be in the economy, you can't simply uh, ask for money from the government. You have to be productive. Yes. So, and this could be an area of disagreement that we have, you know, to what extent do you think private ownership, like sort of Tom Flanagan's position. So, as far as I understand, one of the kinds of things he talks about is home ownership, uh, sort of promoting private property as being one of the um, the kind of the, the methods or the, the mechanisms that could uh, address this dependency. 
is is this something that you agree with or or how, what what's your position on that well i i very much agree with it and and uh and and uh I would say that they have to find a way of introducing private property uh, onto reserves. That's that's the first step that they have to to take. Let me just get let me just give you an example because I am a uh, as I said I'm a rural person and we have our local uh, uh, government our municipal government which is a very <laughs> very uh, um, active government for most people their local government is, is is they're much more involved with it than they are with their provincial or, or federal government and i think that's the case for more, most rural people but why does that work why does our government our local government function it's because people own their own property they pay tax based on their property ownership they mm -hmm. want their money spent properly and if any counselor gets out of line and starts spending money in a way that they don't like that person's just not going to last mm -hmm. so there's this this selfish aspect to it but that's what makes local government work and mm -hmm. that is, does not apply on an indian reserve because all of the money comes from the outside yes. uh, except for except for a few instances the reserves i'm familiar with you, there is no private property there's no home ownership so the 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 um, uh, the property is actually owned uh the, the money comes from the government the band owns the property the person who lives in the house is just a tenant they don't care there's no pride of ownership or any of those things they're not paying taxes for the upkeep of the community maintenance of the road or anything like that and the entire dynamic of reserve life is different as a result so you you're voting for the person uh who's going to get you the most money from the federal government uh, that's basically what it what it comes down to in crude terms so i'm saying that the first thing that they have to do uh, if they want to reform reserves is introduce private property onto reserves but, but how is that going to work in these remote places these remote areas that don't really have a market economy in any sense so it, it makes sense to say okay people who there's an economic circumstance that exists people are working in some kind of capacity they earn a wage and they use that wage to buy their house which then they can sell on the open market to other people but in those remote communities no one is going to want to buy their house who who is outside the community like like that's not a that's not a doesn't seem to me the market principle doesn't seem to be uh, operating in those remote locations where there really is no economy. Well, I mean, I, I agree with you because the 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 the, uh, um, the 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 harsh fact of life is that uh, uh, some people will do much better than than others. If your house happens to be located on the, on the outskirts of <laughs> Vancouver mm -hmm. uh, and you're living on a reserve, you're 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 already doing way better than somebody who lives up in uh, in in northern. Uh, Manitoba. But yeah. here again, I would go back to the Hawthorne report and, and, mm -hmm. and the big answer to those remote communities where you've got uh, just everybody's unemployed except people who are working uh, for the band. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, many of those people shouldn't be there. The mm -hmm. young people should be uh, educating themselves so mm -hmm. that they can find careers and jobs um, 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 in 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 cities and places where <clears throat> where jobs are available i'm just going to use the comparison to that uh, the um, the newfoundland situation when the fisheries closed down well i mean if the if those were indian reserves there would be still be people living there doing nothing well yeah. that wasn't considered that wasn't considered uh, proper or, or sustainable by Joey Smallwood. Why are we, why do we do things differently just because these are indigenous people? That's a double standard. And, and if you really think about it, if you really examine it, it's rather a racist standard because it's it's sort of the, uh, uh, the bigotry of low expectations. Why do we think it's proper for indigenous people to be, uh, to have, live in a community that basically 
total unemployment. Everybody, everybody depends on the government there. The yeah. people at the lower end are on, on welfare, but the people at the upper end are on welfare too. It's just yeah. called transfer payments. That's all. It's just a, it's just a more lucrative uh, kind of, uh, uh, of why are we saying to these people, oh, that's fine. You're indigenous people. So you just sit there and do nothing and watch while all of the social problems develop. Why don't we just treat them the same way as we treat, treated those Newfoundlanders or as we're treating our farming population where I live? Well, yeah. I, as I said, I'm, I'm in a farming area and farmers are getting bigger all the time, which means you need less and less people. It means that the, yeah. small, the, the towns are getting smaller yeah. and that means more people are, are having to find ways of moving out to the oil fields or to the cities or, or the United States or whatever it is. But we expect all of those people to look after themselves. Why do we, why do we treat indigenous people as if they're incapable of doing that? And I've never known the answer to that. Well, well, I think my own view is, is that I think that the, the analogy is not uh, good between either the farming populations or the Newfoundland situation uh, because of the gap, the much wider gap that exists. Plus, if, we, if it is correct, and I don't know what the numbers are for those remote communities, but I think 25% fetal alcohol syndrome is a, is a conservative uh, figure. It's probably higher than that. Uh, and the reason why I use 25% is they did a survey uh, in Quebec, in Northern Quebec, and 25% of the, the young people surveyed women uh, admitted to drinking when they were pregnant. Mm -hmm. And of course, most people, <laughs> this is a problem with surveys is that, you know, you're not going to want to admit to that because it's kind of known you, you shouldn't be doing that. But, and I've heard other kind of, kind of estimates, anecdotal kinds of estimates. But if you have that situation, which does exist, that's not, that's gonna be a much more difficult problem. Like it's not going to be easy to, to kind of deal with the, the, the difficulties which are going to present themselves in terms of integration. And I think that's like, there's an avoid because we haven't really admitted the serious state of emergency situation that exists in many of these communities. We just, we're avoiding it by, you know, just sending the transfers and, and leaving it up to the, the leadership to deal with. And of course the leadership is not, uh, you know, has its own agenda about things. And often it's, it's centered around uh, family, like, the, the, the powerful families within the communities are the ones that, that get access to the, the transfers and the marginalized people who don't have any connections are just sort of, you know, abandoned. And, and th that kind of situation, which, you know, we haven't even really kind of come to terms with that. It, it's not gonna, the Newfoundland situation is not, is not going to uh, be easily brought about which is well no i i'd agree with exactly what, what i it, it, and i don't want to make it sound easy because it's not it's not easy it's very difficult yeah. but maybe a better maybe a better example might be to the rural situation say in uh, uh kentucky or 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 uh, you know in in the um, uh, opioid area where the, where uh you've you've had um uh manufacturing uh leave and uh, you have um, an uneducated uh, class, many people with drug addictions and everything like that. If you read, I'm sure you've read Hillbilly Elegy, CD, you know, Vance's type of thing. Okay, well, that's a good example because uh, you have these real, uh, uh, the kids are coming from these, these, these terribly disadvantaged families parents or a single parent drug addicted and 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 that sort of thing uh, as a result of of uh, you know all sorts of economic policies and that sort of thing which we don't even have to have to go into but maybe that's a better example because those are people who are both rural and urban and they have a huge problem and it is very similar to the de develop 
<laughs> developmental gap, very similar to that, because yeah. these people are in, in terms of education, employability, et cetera, uh, they are far uh, behind the, uh, uh, the average. And yet, what is the answer? The only answer is to end up like J.D. Vance and go to, go to Harvard or Yale or wherever he went to. And I mean, it, it, it can be done. So I, I grant you that in, in some of these communities and yeah. northern communities in particular, a yeah. lot of those people are not going to succeed no matter what. And they are going to be dependent forever. I, I get that. But the, but the, the young people who mm -hmm. do have potential should be given the opportunity to get out of there and not be told by their leaders, oh, you've just got to stay here all your life just because you were born indigenous. And those are the people we should be finding educational programs for and assisting as they, as they make a transition to a place where there are um, more opportunities. But as I say, their, their own leaders are not telling them to do that their own leaders are basically yeah. saying no no you're an indigenous person and and that's that's what uh, that's what you've got to do you've got to uh, um uh, stay here while we pretend to develop a separate economy and while we pr yeah. pretend to have uh, be a nation when when in fact we are a depressed small rural community yes so final topic which i should have been getting onto this earlier is the <laughs> residential schools yeah, which uh, I'll just tell our audience that Brian and I are involved in a research group of about, about the total total of about fifteen people who are who are who are discussing who are people who are interested in having evidence based uh, research with respect to the residential schools, and um, you mentioned that the way in which the residential schools are being thought about has changed quite dramatically uh why do you, when did when did this change if you could just repeat when did this change happen when, when did you sort of see people talking differently about the residential schools well it i i, I as i see it it started after phil fontaine's uh, cbc okay. interview with barbara yep. from i think that was 1990 or 91 yep. Yep. in any event it, things changed uh, um uh drastically after that before uh, during the 70s and 80s when i would have discussions with people yeah a typical conversation would would go something like this well oh i attended the Bertle residential school and it was really lonely there but uh, um uh I'm really glad I had the opportunity to go because now I'm an educated person and the, the, the people that stayed behind didn't get an education. That would sort of be a typical conversation. And then that changed quite drastically after the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, in, Indigenous leadership realized uh, the potential in terms of, of money and political power. Uh, that was uh, involved in residential school, and mm -hmm. and it's and it's it's gone steadily, gotten steadily more and more extreme. So after that, in the 1990s and early 2000s, it was well, there were a lot of there was a lot of abuse at residential uh, residential schools, which is true, which is true. There's a mm -hmm. lot of abuse, and yeah. and and the schools were not uh, were not well run, uh, which is true, and. Um, uh, you know, the government didn't spend enough money on the, uh, the schools, which is also true. And, and there, there were other problems. But now it's gotten absolutely extreme. Now the idea is that these were house, houses of horror where mm -hmm. children were tortured and even murdered and, and secretly buried by priests who uh, forced six-year-olds to help them bury uh, their comrades and everything. It's just getting more and more extreme. And uh, uh, I've watched I've watched the discussion actually change, and it's been kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we have a, a media which just absolutely um, seems to accept anything that an indigenous leader says, no matter how extreme, and not even question it. I, I've never been able to understand that, yeah. where you have a journalist who would normally be be uh, uh, very skeptical and would be uh, would be pressing hard when it comes to an indigenous person saying it. They just accept it, no matter how ridiculous the statement. And since 2015, we have 
had this really unusual situation where we have a federal government mm -hmm. that seems to find it uh, advantageous uh, to not only uh, offer no pushback against these claims, but to um, encourage them and, and to even um, almost flood the communities and grievance groups and everything like that with money. So I think it's almost gotten, uh, it, it, it's, it's almost out of control now. That's the way I, uh, way I see it. And the, uh, the, the, the unmarked graves and the stories we have now about six-year-olds burying uh, children that <laughs> priests murdered and these ridiculous stories. Well, I, I, I just see this as almost a natural development because it's, uh, it's, got, it's gotten out of hand. Yeah, so... Um... It's, do you see it's, it's because of the compensation that can be extracted? Is it because of just animosity, uh, like wanting to blame that kind of have a target, like a, a way of, to some extent, not accepting responsibility for some of the more deeply rooted problems? Um, what, what, why do you, what is the most convincing reason you think as to why well, this change has happened? I think it's both of those and, and, and then even more. The, the, the money part of it is obviously a, a huge factor because reserves have been totally dependent and the strategy of the chiefs for forever has been to try to uh, extract as much money from the government as possible and using blame and uh, you know shaming the public into doing this that has been the strategy and i hope i'm not saying anything offensive there i think i'm just stating stating a fact that the reserves on the whole there are some exceptions but the reserves on the whole are not productive places they're not actually producing wealth they're simply extracting wealth and that's been the strategy of the chiefs all along to try to obtain as as, as much money from the government and to guilt the public in, into providing it but it's not just that it's mm. also um, um, almost um, a uh, a way of of uh, convincing themselves that they have been treated unjustly and that's the explanation for the uh the, the, how poorly so many indigenous people are are doing they mm. want to lay blame for this not on themselves instead of as you say looking at these real problems that only they can solve um and and trying to to lay blame on on others so i think it's it's a yeah. toxic formula yeah do you think that the royal commission on aboriginal peoples played a role in this because that that was in the 90s like that those hearings were held i think they started in about 1991 or 1992 and went through till 1996 and th th those were kind of like going to different communities and having people come and talk and and that seemed to me to be a possibility for this kind of these ideas that were circulating becoming more deeply rooted uh, the pair because that in my view and this is what i talk about in separate but unequal the parallelist position which you've kind of alluded to there that was alan cairns who actually was one of the people on the hawthorne uh, commission he was one of the main mm -hmm. researchers a, a great political scientist who was one of my uh close friends and and a, a person who, who really helped me and and was a mentor i guess if you know anyway uh, but he, the word he used was parallelism, which was these parallel paths, not the integration kind of idea, but the parallel paths. And it was the Royal Commission, which really kind of gave heft, gave intellectual kind of backing to that idea of parallelism. parallelism. And the residential schools were a major kind of area of investigation that the Royal Commission uh, engaged in. Yeah, yeah, no, I, that's, that is, I, I, I agree. It, it, it was uh, the Royal Commission that really gave all of this um, 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 gasoline, if you like. Um, there had always been these discussions within um, uh, the, the, the uh, chief's group, groups, going back to the, um, 
uh, the Indian Brotherhood and that sort of thing. Mm. I read uh, Bill Watney's book, Bill Watney yes. Ruffles yes. Feathers. Okay, yes. so there was always this this discussion, and Bill Watney said, "Look, Indian people." Uh, you're going to have to uh, do the same thing as the white people did and that you are going to have to go to school. You're going to have to learn uh, trades and professions. And he himself was a, was a lawyer. I think he was the first in indigenous uh, trial lawyer in Western Canada. He was an amazing man. Yep. But he, he uh, had what would be called the, the view I do, the integrationist view and he mm -hmm. said no we can be we can be proud indians mm -hmm. but at the same time we have to be productive we have to learn the same skills and we can't just rely on the government for yeah. for money so it was that school of thought that was that was at least as powerful as the other group that said oh no we're different we want to stay separate we have to have our own uh, laws and and that sort of thing the royal commission just absolutely squashed the integrationist uh, uh, view, yeah. and I think that's where they where they really went wrong. Because what they could easily have done is they could have, they could have absolutely praised the the Indian way of life, the Indian culture. There's so much of value there. But at the same time, they could have said, "Look, uh, we're all Canadians. You can be as indigenous as you want in this country." Everybody is able to be as ethnic as they want and, and take pride in their own uh, history and that sort of thing. But do not continue to just blame a society and, and uh, demand more money because that's a deadly path. And I think that and, 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 and seek, uh, you know, these separate laws and, and that sort of thing. And I think that's where uh, we have wasted the last uh, really uh, 25 years, mm -hmm. because we're now at a point where uh, the idea of separate economies and separate nation states yeah. and everything is just dead in the water because there's nothing there. There's yeah. nothing there, and uh, we, uh, we're just we're just spinning our wheels. We're spending more and more money every year, just mm -hmm. dumping money money uh, into a uh, uh, into just keeping people alive, and that should not be. I think Indigenous youth, in particular, are completely being being uh, uh, being cheated, and mm -hmm. uh, we should have said all along, "No, you're not." you're not special, you're just an indigenous person. So what, somebody else is an Irish Canadian, doesn't yeah. make any difference, but yeah. you're going to have to basically do the same thing yeah. as any other rural Canadian, because that's what they are. They're rural Canadians, just like me. And they, um, uh, if, if the job is, is, is someplace else, that's what they've got to do. You can't say, well, I'm indigenous, so I'm gonna stay here forever, even if there's nothing here to support me. So that's basically what I, what I believe, yeah. Anyway. Okay, Brian, I think we've reached our hour. Uh, okay. We could disagree on a few things. Uh, not very much, though, unfortunately. I was, I was trying to look for things, but we have a lot of very sim similar views on the, the residential schools and so on. So now the screens are going to be turned, and uh, you can uh, ask me uh, questions as to what you think, uh, what things that you think that we might disagree on or just generally things that you don't quite understand about my position on various things or just things you're curious about whatever you would like to pursue for the next hour okay well i i i, I do have some things in particular from for reading your books and i, okay. I should say i i read your uh, a friend uh, a fellow judge gave me your disrobing the aboriginal industry um uh, uh, a, uh, a number of years ago, and that was one of the books that really got me interested in 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 uh, uh, in indigenous matters. I I read at that time. I read that, and then of course Tom Flanagan's uh, uh, book, and then I started corresponding with Gordon Gibson, who was also a, a, a you know had had a lot of very interesting things to say about indigenous net matters. So I, I'm I'm familiar with with your work and with your books, and I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't mind if you could go into a little bit of detail about the concept of the uh, developmental gap. Yes. Um, so this was um, a position that Albert Howard and I uh, developed. Uh, so Albert Howard and I met in the Northwest Territories in the 90s. 
And I was kind of, I'm really glad that I met Albert because if I hadn't met Albert, I, I wouldn't have been, my thought processes would not have really developed the way that they are now. I, I was kind of taken a bit with the postmodern position from, from my experience because I did my grad, I did my master's degree at the University of Victoria, which is a hotbed of <laughs> postmodernist uh, uh, you know, reactionary thought. Uh, but anyway, but when Albert and I met, and Albert was a consultant uh, working for uh, Indigenous organizations at the time, a very naive uh, person who thought he was there to assist the Indigenous groups uh, to, you know, to, to politically and so on, and then realized relatively quickly that it was about getting transfers like that's what it's all about like indigenous politics is that way and 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 that led albert and i to have you know quite a many many discussions over a number of years about this and because of albert's um background in historical materialism which is is the nature of the of the, the sort of the theoretical position uh which comes out of the marxist uh, uh, uh theory and engels frederick engels uh, the, the most famous book in this regard is Frederick Engels's book, uh, the, Origin, the Origins of the Family, Private Property and the State. That's the book. And that looks at, uh, was drawn on the work of Lewis Henry Morgan, who it was uh, the, one of the founding fathers of anthropology, along with Edward Tyler, who were the evolutionary theorists. So they, everyone accepts biological evolution now with the exception of a few creationists, but cultural evolution is a much more disputed theoretical framework. And basically cultural evolution is um, that cultures develop according to production, productive processes. That's the historical materialist uh, kind of theory. So depending upon uh, the technology and the division of labor within a society, it will become more complex. It'll be um, in the, the theory is larger, societies become larger, uh, more productive and have greater complexity, which means a greater division of labor within them. And this leads to all sorts of cultural advancement. So advancement is not, and this is where we start to go off the rails a bit, is it's not making any value judgments about different societies. So the language often is used in a very value oriented way, which makes it sound like you're, you're classifying a group as being inferior or something like that, or they should be deprived of rights because of this. But it's just a kind of a factual uh, acceptance that earlier society all societies so it's not all of our ancestors were at an earlier stage of development than we are currently uh, because the the productivity was lower the the groups were smaller and they had a less of a division of labor and so when you start to have larger groups more productive groups more complex groups then you start to have developments in, in, in culture such as knowledge uh, and technology such as literacy, which allows for more abstraction, uh, the ability to understand things more, political systems change, and this is where we have difficulties in political science with this, is that um, early societies were um, Kinship was the organizing, the political, the, the kind of the nature of politics, kinship politics, tribal politics, where you, the closer you are related to a group, the more you defend them and the more, uh, you know, distant you are, the more you won't be uh, kind of treated to the same, you won't be, receive the same loyalty to modern societies where what's called legal rational principles take hold. And you'll you notice this within the court system is that um, if you have a jury, you don't want to have your mother <laughs> determining uh, what the sentence is going to be, or you, you you want it to be impartially decided according to rules which are 
generally applied equally to all citizens within the political system, that works in larger, more complex societies, but it doesn't, it's not the, the type of politics that, that it occurs in, in smaller, uh, uh, sort of less productive societies. Anyway, so what you see is gradually an, uh, sort of an evolutionary development in terms of what's called modes of production. So hunting and gathering is the less, least developed mode of production. And then you get into um, horticulture where you have, uh, it's not draft animals and so on, but you're still food production. And then you have, you know, feudalism, and then you have uh, capitalism, and then perhaps other modes of production in the future, but that's never really been completely, uh, you know, sort of sorted out yet. But what happened in the case of the, the Canadian system is that you had the gap, the, the, the developmental gap in terms of modes of production, size of society, productivity, and complexity was probably the widest that had ever happened with groups meeting together. So you had the English and the French that were just making the transition from feudalism to capitalism with relatively well-developed legal systems and economic systems. And you had universities at that time and so on as well. So the, the sci although science hadn't really um, you know, reached its heyday, there was certainly a great deal of knowledge meeting with um, hunting and gathering societies, uh, pre-literate groups uh, based on kinship, also horticultural societies as well. So um, the, the Iroquois is the best example of this, uh, of you know having corn and squash and uh, production. So they, they were more developed, the Iroquois, than, for example, the Inuit. Um, but this large gap in development made it difficult, uh, especially in the transition to capitalism. So the fur trade worked relatively well in that context because hunting and gathering could be used by the economic system. And in fact, was quite beneficial in some ways to indigenous groups, brought them technology that they didn't have before. But when the fur trade uh, started to decline and, and, and it was really agriculture and industrial development that became the more dominant economic processes, um, it became much more difficult for Indigenous people to participate in that system. And because uh, the, like it was a profit-based system, it wasn't like the, the system wasn't engaging with Indigenous people to a large extent to assist them. It was to, to use them for whatever purposes there wasn't very much effort that was spent in trying to bridge that gap. And I think that that bridging of the gap is still the major challenge that exists. And we have much greater sensitivity today and it could be done in a much better way, but because we've kind of been sidetracked onto all these kinds of relativistic types of reactionary positions, we haven't really been able to, to kind of grapple with it at all at this stage. And in fact, we seem to be going backwards in terms of the situation. So in, from my perspective, I should just, because I, like I'm very different from Tom Flanagan. Uh, Flanagan and I have a very collegial relationship and I, I appreciate a, a great deal of what he has to say, but um, he, he, when he focuses on private property as sort of being the major area, my, my concern is, is be, being, becoming a member of the working class. Like that, that is the, that should be the focus for um, the future of indigenous people. Is, and that's, it's marginalization from the working class that is really the root cause of, of the isolation and, and the difficulties that exist for the indigenous population. Well, uh, you know, comment on this. It seems to me that the, the, the biggest problem with, um, and I agree completely with you on, on, on your analysis there uh, and that th this gap is very real, but the biggest problem to overcoming this gap is the refusal by indigenous leaders to acknowledge that a gap exists. Instead of saying, yes, we, we obviously need to, particularly with the, the more remote communities that have uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the biggest, you know, the, the, the longest way to go, 
uh, instead of saying yes, we have to we have to to, to bridge this gap. It, it, instead, it's saying no, no. You don't understand. We just have a different way of doing things, and and we have a different kind of uh, uh, we have a different kind of culture. It's not any. We don't have any gap. That's a that's an insult to us to say we, we have a gap. So instead, we've got to do things our our own way and develop our own uh, special economies, and uh, we have to revert to our um, indigenous languages and 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 revert to. Uh, original uh, um, uh, customs and that sort of thing. And that is going to be uh, the way we're going to prosper. Did you want to comment on that? Yeah, and I think I think that's true to some extent, but I think really what we have to look at is the Aboriginal industry's role in all of this. So mm -hmm. this has been um, gradually happening more and more. So in the, in the 60s with the reaction to the white paper, that was when it sort of first started. And the idea that sort of the legal route was going to be how Indigenous problems were solved. And, and that's, that's tied in with the being isolated from the working class. So in working class politics, if you're a member of the working class, you have power because you produce what it is that society needs. If you're not productive and you're not a member of the working class, if you're isolated from the working class, you don't have any power. And so you, that this kind of led to a reliance on the legal system to make demands about, um, and you saw this really early on in disrobing the Aboriginal industry, this is documented quite a lot where you would have lawyers kind of making these cases which, you know, might have some legal merit to them about treaties not being signed and therefore sovereignty not being solidified. And so therefore, you know, money had to be paid out to solidify sovereignty and this kind of thing. These kinds of very, very complex legal arguments got seized a hold of and, and that's kind of continued. And everything is like that now, uh, which doesn't really do anything about the developmental problem. It just extracts what's called rent uh, from the system, whether it be compensation or um, uh, royalties or uh, one of the most destructive aspects, which is you know money for culturally sensitive services, which you know, like you mentioned the indigenous languages. So I don't know how much money is being spent on the indigenous language. And, and all sorts of ways when, uh, you know, these languages are not like they're, they're pre-literate. Like they've had, they've been, linguists have developed uh, writing for them, but they're not, that's not their origin. So it's all kind of artificial, all these kind of created things. And then to kind of suggest that these languages are going to be functional in an international kind of global system is just, it's totally uh, unrealistic and not gonna do anything. And so, but that's all the industry that's doing this. So the industry kind of promotes these kinds of things. The leadership, the neo-tribal elites, as I call them, get, you know, some of it, they get a certain amount of the piece of the action. So they're kind of, brought on side with respect to it. And then all that, the funds that should be going into a, a much more in-depth strategy to kind of deal with this developmental gap is kind of abandoned. And, and that's what we see with all these kinds of initiatives. And, and you know, I, in disrobing the Aboriginal history, Albert and I, you know, that's one thing that's gotta be grappled with is defunding the industry. So there's all sorts of funds going into like the forty billion dollars that just has just happened. Like, I don't I don't know you know would know more than me being in you know in the legal system. But why did that have to like? Is there is there some way to stop that from happening? I don't know. I know these human rights commissions and everything. I don't quite know the ins and outs of it. But that is just that is terrible that that's happened. Uh, because now it's a precedent for whatever else is going to happen. And, 
And before we had like, a, it was a bad enough drain on the system, but now $40 billion is the, uh, is the amount. So those kinds of large payouts, um, I don't know legally how this can be stopped or if it can be, but that's kind well, of- yeah, I, I and and uh, on. I should tell you that uh, your point about the the uh, the, the alliance between the uh, say the the chiefs and the uh, and the legal system. Uh, I've had arguments with legal colleagues, and they really think that they have helped indigenous people. They think that the legal system has really helped them along. And I say, no, no, you have basically retarded the 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 the, the whole process of integration by probably a couple of decades because oh, yeah. the 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 alliance has been so lucrative for both groups. Yeah, yeah. For both groups, yeah. now we now have the elite. Um, uh, law firms that have very often worked on uh, land claims and treaty claims and, and duty to consult and uh, grievance claims and that sort of thing. So there's this mutually beneficial uh, financial relationship that I think has has is costing the country not just in terms of huge amounts of money, but has also set back any possibility of indigenous uh, integration. Because what you get, and you can comment on this, is what you get by simply dumping money into unproductive communities is you just get further dependence. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you wanted to comment on that. I, I think that's true. And as well, this is the other problem, uh, is, is the we don't really have any honest conversations about this. It's becoming more and more difficult to try to communicate about the problems. So, and, and I noticed this in the university system, it, it, it's, it's become, because of the idea that if you're not indigenous, you know, you shouldn't really have anything to say about it. Like you're, you're Ill, it's illegitimate for you to, to, to raise these concerns, uh, which, you know, 20 years ago, would, you wouldn't really hear that very, it would be kind of understood that you, you have different lenses which can be brought on issues just because of your ancestral background that shouldn't really have any bearing on your ability to provide some, you know, insights into something. Now, you're not, obviously not gonna have the whole picture and it's very important to bring in views of uh, people who've had the actual experiences within the communities and so on, like no one's denying that, but still that's not to say you just kind of give over all your critical faculties and just have to accept everything that an indigenous uh, uh, neo-tribal elite uh, has to say. Um, and so now we're in a very, you know, very difficult situation because there really isn't very much space for any kind of open exchange of views and people now just kind of defer to anything that uh, an indigenous leader says. So I think that's kind of the biggest problem right now. Uh, and I don't know if this is gonna change with the unmarked graves kind of stuff that's going on because it's possible that some things have been overreach. So because we were expected to go along with all the wild claims, because of course, these were the neo-tribal elites that were making these and they were indigenous and who are we as non-indigenous people to have anything to say about this? It just kind of took off to this kind of crazy hysterical kind of thing. And now it's like, whoa, like everyone's sort of in this kind of discombobulated state about it, which I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but that, that was sort of the worst example of no critical thinking being employed at all. So it, it's hope that at some point we could have some more open discussion about it. And that maybe is a way to bring things back on, you know, Onto the onto the path where we can we can try and figure some things out, uh, but that's that's kind of my own you know where I'm sort of sitting right now. But.
Well, let, let maybe that can be a segue into another question I wanted to ask you. And this has, in, in, in disrobing, you talked about um, oral knowledge and 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 the, all of these various terms. And now we have uh, terms like way of knowing and knowledge keepers with the uh, unmarked graves, for instance. We've got a number of uh, Indigenous leaders saying, well, um, uh, we, ha we have a way of knowing in the community. So... Uh, in, in, in the Kamloops case, for instance, the chief said, well, we, um, uh, we have a way of knowing that uh, six-year-olds were forced by priests to go out and help bury their fellow comrades from residential schools. Now, that, <laughs> on the face of it, you'd think, well, that's, uh, that's quite a claim. Where's your evidence for that? Yeah. Um, I mean, the idea that priests somehow murdered children or nuns did and, and then secretly buried them under apple trees um, is, is quite an astounding claim. But, but if you say, well, where's your evidence? They would say, uh, well, we had a way of knowing. And even the person, uh, the um, junior person that did the uh, uh, ground penetrating radar work, which is basically like hauling a little lawnmower around over the thing and, and finding disturbances. Um, she, she even said, well, they told me because of their way of knowing, uh, they told me where to look. They told me where to drag my little machine around mm -hmm. uh, because they had a way of knowing. Now, not one reporter even said, well, what the heck is a way of knowing? You know, what's the difference between a way of knowing and gossip in the community, for instance? Uh, yeah. You know, what, what's the difference? No, nobody said, it, it, they seem to be so polite that nobody even mentioned it. But um, with your experience with, with oral knowledge, your, your, the, the experience you talk about in um, disrobing, I wonder if you could comment on, on, yes. on this part. Yeah, so the words, the description is traditional knowledge. So, and it's, it, the orality is part of its method, I guess. Uh, and, and this has been a long, and so that's actually what got Albert and I into the whole thing was uh, the Broken Hill Properties diamond, not diamond mine that was happening in the Northwest Territories. And I guess it was 1996. Um, that was, that was when we, we first heard about it and, and it was very no one knew any like no one understood what anyone was talking about and it was kind of got that's what got me into trouble originally with the, is that I, I was I was asking questions about what it was and no one could answer the questions like like no one knew what anyone was talking about and it turned out through like many years of investigations that it was um, a, a combination of uh, what's called local knowledge, whereby, and that's not indigenous, that, that's something that anyone has who's been lived in an area for a long period of time or, or observed an area for a long period of time, and no one disputes that, that that could be uh, helpful in terms of data that could then be subjected to critical scrutiny. It tends to be anecdotal and not very rigorous, so you would need scientific kinds of research design to be able to figure out whether it was representative or not. And then you have the spiritual beliefs aspect, that what's called the revelatory kind of, what's claimed to be knowledge, but it's, and this is, I think, what is being talked about with these knowings with respect to uh, the unmarked graves. So there's this kind of in, almost intuition, this kind of sense, um, but there's a there's a big there's a taboo now to question elders about this. Like you feel that it's at at best disrespectful to do it, and at worst it's kind of being anti-indigenous to question it. And so um, this is a real problem for the unmarked graves, and it, it's I think it's one of the reasons why there's been this reluctance amongst the media to question and even the fifth estate for people who haven't watched the fifth estate episode in february sorry in, in january 2022 i'm not sure about you brian but i found that to be shocking watching that episode yeah. because the fifth estate for people who don't know that 
program is kind of billed as the flagship Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's investigative journalistic program where they're going to bring their, you know, very, very, uh, you know, journalistic uh, kinds of skills to figure out things on this program and ask the hard questions. Anyway, I, it was one of the more disturbing things I've seen in the last year to watch Gillian Finley, who is a very accomplished journalist, investigative journalist, kind of just soft peddling questions to indigenous uh, people to like, and basically just believing everything that they said. No hard questions, no, like the kinds of things that our research group is talking about. So you would have this one woman, I can't remember uh, what her, her name was, but she said that when she was walking along, uh, going back from church, I think, she turned and she saw four boys hanging in a barn. That was what she remembered. And um, that, that needs to be investigated, that claim. So, you know, who were these boys? What was the, you know, what were their names? What was this, when was this? Like what, who were, who was in charge at the school at this time? These sorts of things. But instead it's just, oh, well, she saw, she saw four boys hanging from, you know, hanging in a barn. That must've been, that must've been true. And, and this is kind of ties into this, this kind of second aspect of traditional knowledge, which is this, it doesn't need evidence. It's just your belief. If you believe it's true, it's true. And often it has a, it was a dream or you spoke, you had a ceremony where you communicated with the ancestors or, you know, these, all these various sources, but it's not, there's nothing that can be verified by other people that are, you know, can, can look at the, look at what you're talking about and, and determine whether it's, it's some kind of evidence or not. That's not, that's not part of that. So I, I find this unmarked grace because, you know, we, we, we now need to get to the bottom of this. We seriously need to get to the bottom of this. And, you know, because of our deference to these indigenous ways of knowing and that kind of, that kind of, uh, difficulties in discussing it that's been built up over the last 20 years um this is unless we kind of face that head on and say you know indigenous ways of knowing are, are not not really much of it is not knowing it's believing and it's not rigorous it, it's it's like any kind of folk kind of you know knowledge if you're going to call it that but you know folk ways, the folk ways of the people, like there can be some truth to it. And, and it's possible, like, and this is something I didn't ask about, like, is it possible that there are dead children buried in that orchard? What do you think? Do you think that, that is there any, like, there, it's possible, uh, but is it likely that that's the case? Well, well, by putting it, uh, you know, changing that slightly, is it possible that there are 25,000 and maybe more similar secretly buried uh, children all over this country? And uh, because we're getting not just the Kamloops uh, group now, but Williams Lake, then there was another one the other day. And now we've had $320 million spent by the government to encourage this type of thing. Yeah. We're going to have dozens of these claims um, and, and they're really, they're quite crazy. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll just, just put it very bluntly. These are, these are quite crazy. In the four communities where they've actually, where these stories existed about children buried under apple trees and, and, and priests murdering uh, children and having six-year-olds help them and that sort of thing. Four communities in Canada where they, they, they had those same stories and they did do excavation, nothing was found. So and where, why don't- sorry, we... where, where were those communities? Because I was asked this and I, I'd heard about it, but I didn't know the specific names of the yeah of the place. Uh, in, in, in Shibnecadie, in Nova Scotia, in Cooper's Island, BC, 
uh, in uh, at Brantford, that's a Mohawk community in Ontario, okay, yeah, yeah. and uh, at uh, Camsel uh, in in Alberta. That was I was in an Indian hospital. The same stories about burials. Yeah. Uh, Shemnekadi was really interesting because they did find graves, but they okay. found graves of. Uh, uh, Irish settlers who, uh, from a hundred years before the school even opened up. Okay. So in all of these communities, there were no graves found, yep. but you had practically no news reports about that. So it seems to me a responsible media would yep. would be commenting, saying, look, uh, these the same way of knowing stories in, in the community uh, about uh, priests uh, killing children and secretly burying them. They had the same stories. They excavated, there were no graves found. So you'd think a responsible media would, would bring those to the attention of Canadians, but they, but they, but they, they really haven't. So uh, it, it, it's really, it, it's really I, I, I can't really understand what's going on where uh, uh, you have all of these stories. And as you know, Francis, we've, uh, with our head research person, we found that the missing children um, uh, that we've investigated, the so-called missing children, the ones who are, uh, according to the mm -hmm. TRC commissioners, yeah. went to residential school and never returned, mm -hmm. uh, and, and thousands of them. Well, mm -hmm. the ones we've investigated, that's not the case at all. We have mm -hmm. death certificates. We showed that these people were, they lived and they, they, they died sometimes at residential schools, but sometimes uh, far away from residential schools in uh, uh, accidents and, uh, and all sorts of things. But the important point is that they were never missing. They're not secretly buried anywhere. They're, they're buried in mainly in their home communities. They were given the normal Christian burials of the time. There are death certificates for every one of these children. Hmm. But when we send this information to the media, uh, the mainstream media and say, look, we found these children. Aren't you happy? They're not missing. We yeah. get absolutely no response. So it's just very, very strange to me that the media has completely failed to do its job and just accepts these claims like a way of knowing and, and things which are pure gossip. The other point, maybe I'll get you to comment on it because in your essay, Billy Remembers, yep. um, you talk about Kevin Annett yes. and his, his role in this. <laughs> and I, and I'm, 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 I'm fascinated because I've done a lot of, uh, well, all of us have done a lot of investigation on this, this, this man. Yeah. And uh, it seems to me, and I'm going to get you to comment, uh, because you, 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 you titled your essay, Billy Remembers. And that was yeah. after Billy, Billy Coombs, yeah. who was one of these uh, unfortunate uh, uh, Indigenous people that Annette ran into on Vancouver's uh, 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 skid row. Yep. And he was telling these fantastic tales about uh, priests murdering children and the queen kidnapping children at the, at the Kamloops school. And yep. then he met up with, with, with Kevin Annett, who is an articulate and, 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 and rather uh, skilled person who sort of made these stories semi-believable. Mm. And uh, it seems to me, and I'm going to get your comment, it seems to me that he's had a huge role in all of this, that this is really where all of these stories really got their legs and started to take off in Indigenous communities and are absolutely believed by many people, not just the unsophisticated people that you would expect might believe them, but even the chiefs and these very important people, even the TRC commissioners seem to believe uh, these stories that priests were throwing babies into furnaces and six-year-olds were burying children and that sort of thing. So do you wanna comment on the role of Kevin Annett and what you found? Yeah. So. And this is a bit of a point of disagreement on our research group as to how much is due to Annette. We don't, this is not all that clear, uh, but still, he certainly has had some influence. We, we can't deny <laughs> he's had some influence. And I remember, because when I started looking into the residential school stuff, uh, because I, I was reluctantly dragged into the residential school research because I, Albert and I did a little bit in disrobing the Aboriginal industry. And I remember uh, uh, there was a book uh, by Chris John and Young, I think, 
uh, which talked about the genocide, like he was making these claims about genocide. And I thought, I remember Albert and I characterized it as hysterical <laughs> at the time, because like, like that was so far out in, I guess it was 2006 or whenever we started writing about it, like to, to call the residential schools genocide was so far out to us, we saw it as a hysterical kind of claim. Um, and so when I was doing, I, I came back into the residential schools uh, to, to look at them, I guess, and it was in about 2016 after the TRC, because I just thought the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was very unbalanced. And I, I, I didn't, I thought that there needed to be more critical analysis. Anyway, when I was doing research, I, I, I found the Kevin Annette materials. Uh, and I was reading, you know, about babies being thrown into furnaces. And, and I thought, what, like, I was going, wow. And, and I noticed at the time that no one was, no one was taking, taking them up. Like it was not, it was very marginal and it wasn't really paid attention to. Uh, and I don't even think the TRC uh, really even, you, I don't think he, he's, he's really relied upon at all, Kevin on that. Like, it's kind of strange that he did all this stuff and, and the TRC never really had him as a witness or I'm not sure what happened there, but I don't think he was really very much involved. And uh, so, but then like the kind of stories that he was telling became when we had the discuss, when we had the, the, the announcement in May of 2021 about the Kamloops case, then like the stories were quite similar to what Annette was, was kind of disseminating in his books. And, and we don't really know to this day, except the only thing we have, the only actual corroborating evidence that we have that is not Annette is Billy Coombs's uh, testimony on Unrepentant. So in the film Unrepentant, which is on the internet, anyone can watch it, uh, there's a segment where you see the apple orchard at Kamloops, and then there's a short clip of, of, of Billy Coombs saying that he witnessed as a child, you know, uh, someone being buried in the apple orchard. And Annette is right behind him. You can see Annette's face right behind Coombs. So Annette was involved. So like, is this an actual memory of Coombs or is it Annette's kind of fancy? So, cause unrepentant, I'm not sure when that, that uh, footage was taken but it was probably in the nineties that, that it was. But anyway, Annette was doing these kind of circle, healing circle kinds of things with a whole bunch of people in the downtown east side. Annette had some connection to the satanic abuse allegations. Like he was making these satanic abuse allegations, which is a famous kind of hysteria that happened in the 80s and the 90s in the United States and Canada. So there's probably a bit of a tie in there. Uh, and so th that's kind of an open question still. Like, like, like Annette did all this stuff People presumably were watching his videos and watching Unrepentant, and he had some connections to the Mohawk school, and he was actually sort of chased out of the community because people thought he was grandstanding, and you know he, he didn't get along with the indigenous group there, and and he actually brought out some bones that he claimed he'd found, and it turned out that they were animal bones, and it was evident. Yeah, let me just add, 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 because that's really interesting, Francis. He, he found not one set of bones, but he found two sets of bones. So first of all, Annett said he found bones when they did the excavation, because no. at, at, they did do an excavation, an informal excavation. They found no graves. Yeah, but he yeah. pulled out a bunch of bones and said, oh, these are children's bones. And he was waving these around, apparently, in Toronto. And he was, that, that's one of the reasons why he was denounced. But he also found, said he found bones in the furnace. So there you have the, uh, you know, he said they're children's bones. And, he, and that there you have the priest throwing baby in the, in the furnace type of thing. Uh, 
So that was the first, the, the first one of those. And I think that was in 2011 or 2012. So that comes, that, that was at least 10 years ago. And that also was of course exposed as, as, as a fraud. And so the Mohawk community and anybody could watch the video of them denouncing him and throwing him out of the community. He didn't just have the one set of bones he said were children's bones. He had the two, one from the furnace and one from the, the graves. Not many people know that, but it's kind of it, it's kind of interesting. But no, I agree with you that that uh, that um, there's no way of knowing how much influence he's he's had. Mm. But, uh, uh, you know, my theory about where these stories come from, and it's just my theory. But mm. I think that these were originally children's stories. These were stories, maybe, maybe kids in residential schools late at night uh, were telling ghost stories and they'd see the priest or the, the nun in their dark clothes and they would, uh, they'd be naturals. They look like, you know, they would look like uh, scary characters. So they started telling these ghost stories, totally chi childish ghost stories. And then it took somebody like Kevin Annette to make these stories respond respectable but the the story that really is the is the bridge here i think we can't forget the story about the queen because <laughs> the story about the queen it shows that's clearly a story a child would tell and just for anybody who's who's watching yeah. the, the the story basically is that the queen walked up with to uh, to the Kamloops school with prince philip in tow and and made a made the uh, made one of the children kiss her silver foot or boot, boot and then took them on a yeah and then took them on a on a on a, a, a picnic and kidnapped 10 of the children now you think what you know that's so crazy nobody would believe it and yet it's been around for a long time and if you go to the internet there mm. are numerous fact checks there's snopes there's yeah, reuters yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and so this story has been making the rounds and people actually believe it but that's one story that that is is useful because it's sort of I believe it's sort of a bridge. It shows yeah. no, that's a child story. Yeah. Uh, no, no adult, no sophisticated adult could possibly believe it. No. But uh, the the other stories, well, they've been embellished a bit, and they've had this Kevin Annette. He's a smoothie, and yeah. there are uh, there are other people as well who have been sort of pushing these stories along. Yeah. So right. uh, the thing that's been amazing to me, Francis, is that it is not just the unsophisticated people who believe these preposterous stories about you know uh, priests throwing babies and and, and into furnaces and, and six-year-old <laughs> worrying uh, children in the middle of the night and that sort of thing it's also people who should know better it's it's even the trc commissioners seem to yeah. to accept these well, stories it's like I, you know it's like we believe you like like this kind of we believe you idea which is is kind of a, if you don't, your gas, and this is the other term that you hear, which you probably have, is, and I got it. I, I never heard this term before, but when I did my first uh, attempt at the political economy of neo-tribal rentarism, talking about the, the like the the uh, the claims and their rent-seeking uh, potential, um, I got accused of gaslighting. <laughs> So you hear an improbable claim and skepticism and, and you shouldn't like, this is kind of the, the other problem is, and it's like um, people who have, who claim that they, they've been uh, sexually assaulted and, and this sort of idea, we believe you, which I think when I first heard that we believe you, I thought, whoa, that's not good because that is denying the presumption of innocence. So in our justice system, if you are accused, there's a presumption of innocence, whereas the we believe you is not a presumption of innocence. It's a presumption of guilt because we're believing the person who's making the claim. And it's the same kind of thing that's going on in these kinds of allegations that are happening now. Um, and so you get accused of being unsympathetic and uncaring to people who could potentially have suffered these terrible things like like th this is a difficulty for testimonies generally and 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 it's possible that there's no there's no good outcome for this i like i don't know all i know is that you know as academics or as intellectuals 
we we need to have our critical faculties intact and it, it's not we shouldn't be discouraged from raising questions about what appears to be improbable kinds of claims and as you were speaking before i just wanted to bring up a couple of things which which i i, I kind of forgot about until uh, a few minutes ago uh, one of them is um a woman by the name of irene favel who's on the internet who was interviewed in some kind of cbc town hall in 2008 and she brought up the furnace story so there's test like it's actual she claims that she saw a nun throw a baby into a furnace and smelled the the flesh of human <laughs> flesh burning from that throwing the baby into the furnace i don't know what her story is and where she fits in but that's been viewed several thousand times by a whole bunch of people secondly one of the people who's recently come forward with an eyewitness account, Eddie Jules, uh, in the book Beyond Closed, Behind Closed Doors is interviewed. And that book was published in 2000. Eddie Jules at the time in 2000 said students used to kind of talk about the furnace. That um, girls would, who have been impregnated by priests there would be abortions done and the aborted fetuses, I assume, would be thrown into the furnaces and they would hear the, and no one ever saw this. There were no, no eyewitness accounts of this, but they heard about it. They talked about it. Like there was this kind of, these stories that were being told at the time about this happening. And, and that seems to me to be the furnace, kind of the, the kind of fixation on the furnace, the, the clanging of the furnace doors, the, they would hear the furnace be charged up again and it'd say, oh, there's another, there's another fetus being thrown into the furnace. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that, I don't, I, to some extent, I guess it's the Catholic opposition to abortion and girls getting pregnant and all the, you know, and it being a secret. So if a girl got pregnant, I guess, in a Catholic school, there would be certain amount of hush hush and I'm not sure what was done about it, but it would have had this kind of secrecy about it. And, and maybe this kind of got turned into these stories, but you know, there's a mm -hmm. number of different routes about that it could have happened. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. I, 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 but you know, uh, some of these preposterous stories are even in the, TRC report. I yeah. mean, let, let's remember people like, um, uh, what's her name, Doris Young. Okay, Doris Young testified before the uh, TRC. And remember, there was no cross-examination. Mm -hmm. There were no legal safeguards, nothing. These people mm -hmm. told their yeah. stories and the, the commissioners basically just believed all of these stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 so Doris Young said uh, she was a student at the uh, at the Elkhorn Residential School, and she witnessed, uh, you know, a child or children being murdered right in the classroom with blood all over the place. Now, I mean, there were no police report, no evidence to back up anything like that. I mean, it's a completely pros uh, a preposterous story. No mm -hmm. parent coming saying, oh, look, my child just was, was murdered or anything like that. No evidence to back up at all. And yet the commissioners seem to believe her. Now, we also know that there are a lot of uh, similar stories that were not released in the report. And we're, we don't have, <laughs> we don't have access to them. We're not allowed to have access to them. They've been sealed. But how many of the Billy Coombs type of stories with, uh, uh, you know, priests tossing babies into furnaces and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, children being hung in barns and all of these absolutely wild mm. uh, crazy claims uh, are there um, uh, that probably uh, would show very clearly how exaggerated and, and, and ridiculous really uh, some of these stories are. So I know it's a very, very difficult thing because you're assumed to be sort of 
uh, a, an anti-indigenous or sort of a racist or a, a Holocaust yeah. denier or whatever, if, if you if you doubt these claims, and yet these claims are getting more and more preposterous all the time. Yeah. Uh, we've had we've had the uh, uh, the NCTR, the successor to the TCR, uh, TCR, saying that there are 2,800 missing children, that they were children who um, uh, went to residential school and never returned. You know, mm. so first of all, we're supposed to be asked, uh, asked to believe that somehow 2,800 sets of parents didn't even notice that their child never returned to a yeah. home. I mean, it's, it's yeah. preposterous. There's not yeah. a single police report, but then the numbers start to jump. So mm -hmm. then you get the 6,000. And then uh, one of the commissioners even said 25,000 and maybe more. Yeah. And then Kevin Annett says 50,000 and he yeah. Yeah. goes up to yeah. 250,000. Yeah. Yeah. So these claims are just getting more and more ridiculous and extreme all the time because there is no pushback. Yeah. You have nobody in the media doing their job and pushing back. The politicians are staying away from it. Trudeau is basically promoting it and daring the opposition leader to push back at all. And then he'll claim he's anti-Indigenous if he does. So I think we're in a hopeless spot right now where uh, nobody can, can actually speak the truth. And as you know, the uh, Indian Affairs Minister, whatever they, there's two of them now, I don't even know the terms, yeah. but Mark Miller said that anybody who even says what you and I are talking about right now is, is voicing disgusting and insidious comments, yeah. and he's yeah. considering making it illegal, you know, hate speech to even ask these questions. So I think we're in a, a totally hopeless spot in this country where our only option seems to be to accept whatever claim anybody makes and just uh, um, and, and compensate them. I don't know. What, what's your opinion about that, Francis? Well, I, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a volatile situation. So um, it's hard to know where it's going to go. I, I think there is some movement on it now. Uh, I think there is, you know, skepticism, um, you know, someone like Jacques Riard, who is um, the labor historian who wrote in the Dorchester Review, uh, you know, he was someone who wasn't even connected to the discussions in the residential schools, but just felt, I believe, I, I can't speak for him, but I assume he felt as an ethical person, as a historian, I, I need to, you know, state some of the obvious, <laughs> you know, emperor has no clothes kind of thing here, which is, you know, we have no bodies uh, that have been found yet we're making all these claims about it and then for that he gets castigated by a government minister for being ghoulish for having the audacity to you know demand evidence for these kinds of claims so um but the fact that that was published the fact that my piece was published the the, the fact that you see a little bit less uh you know hysteria going on everyone's kind of i think like taking stock a little bit here hopefully um i think that it's possible that we could be you know dialing it back um the, the thing i fear though this is what i fear the most is the the kind of irrationality that's taking hold throughout society generally and the clamping down on freedom of expression, that is going to open things up for a, a totalitarian push that is going to come forward because we're losing the ability to communicate uh, as some kind of universal public square. It's been happening for quite some time, but things seem to be really breaking down. And because you know, the left, like I'm a person who comes at it from a historical materialism. So the left has just completely disintegrated and has been taken over by this woke kind of totalitarian identity politics. So there's really no class politics anymore. And then what is going to make room, I think what's going to, one potential really negative outcome is, you know, this white identity politics, which is, you know, kind of emerging because that's kind of um in history when you you have this kind of narcissistic decadent kind of thing happening uh uh 
Uh, Brian, your your thumb is getting put over the. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you have this narcissistic, <laughs> decadent kind of thing happening. It it allows the heroic kind of figure to come and just kind of clear out all the <laughs> all the narcissistic, decadent kind of stuff. And I I don't want that to happen. I want I want us to restore some kind of rationality to the way we're talking about things which potentially can head off this kind of outcome, which I think is, is possible, which I'm really dreading if that's the case. And, you know, everything that's happened in the last, you know, year and a half, you know, seems to signal things kind of spiraling out of control. And I, I'm really, this is part of the reason for the rational space disputations is, you know, I, I assume, uh, Brian, you're a, you're, you would call yourself a conservative, I yeah. think. Uh, a small C I, conservative, yeah. yeah. And I'm a historical materialist, which mm -hmm. comes out of the Marxist tradition, but I can talk to, <laughs> I can mm -hmm. talk to you and mm -hmm. we can have a conversation. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if I tried to have a conversation with one of my person colleagues who calls themselves quote unquote left wing, which I don't see as left wing at all, I see it as uh, reactionary, we can't even like everything's broken down. We we can't. And and the same with if I'm going to have a discussion with a Trump supporter or something, I'm not going to be able to talk to them. But there's kind of a a group of people who still think that reason debate and and so on is possible, and and that's kind of the uh, uh, the future, I think. Uh, anyway, on that note, uh, Brian, <laughs> we've come to our two okay. hour points in the okay. discussion. So I thought that was very, very interesting. Um, I don't think we disagreed on very, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to continue to keep on calling this a disputations if I'm, if I'm agreeing with everyone on what we talk about, but I think there was a lot of very interesting things, you know, discussed in terms of indigenous policy and the residential schools. So. I wanted to thank you very much for appearing on this uh, this program, and and I'm hoping to talk to other people with 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 interesting ideas as well. Okay, well, thanks very much for inviting me, and maybe we we can have something we can really disagree on at some point. Sure. So. Thank you. <laughs>